Hello, hello, and welcome to another exciting episode of Skeptics and Seekers Sunday Sermon. This is David and Mac. How are you doing, Mac? I'm pretty tired, but I'm all right. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I hear you. Uh, I, I I think both of us probably have work schedules that are running us ragged. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. But that's that's cool. Um you know, I really wish we had time to go over, you know, some of the last stuff that uh, we were talking about on the board that you were wrong about. Um, <laughs> but <there's, laughs> neither neither one of us have that kind of time either. So I'm going to try to do uh, an after show. I plan to talk uh, for about 40 minutes on here. This might even be considered a supplemental. I'm not sure. But it, it's something that got left on the cutting room floor uh, last week that was uh, intended to be discussed in the after show, but was not, which is a, a thing you said, and we discussed for like a couple of minutes. It it needs more time, though, and that is the concept of the whole counsel of God. And uh, I believe I said in the show, I don't even know what that is. I don't I don't know practically speaking what that means or what that could even mean. And uh, I wrote a little bit on the board. Uh, so anyone who wants to follow the discussions on the board, uh, skepticsandseekers.squarespace.com, just log into your discuss account, discuss away. You can send an email at skepticsandseekers at gmail.com. Mac, since you use this expression a lot, I'm going to give you the first crack at explaining what it is you mean, because I've got a feeling that different Christians mean different things by this expression, the whole counsel of God. Well, it pretty much means that when it comes to how you do theology, that you take care that you don't emphasize some texts over and against others. So, for instance, if you read a passage that says God is love, you're like, oh, okay. But then there's another part of the Bible where God is judging people. You don't say, well, I don't like the judging. I like the loving more. So let's uh, let's find a way to make the judging look like maybe it's not, uh, it's not on the same tier. So pretty much uh, picking and choosing which texts you prefer. And so in that sense, you could say you're doing theology, sure, but you're not do, like you're not engaging with the full counsel uh, of what's happening. It's like if, 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 there's a, if, if the president gave out a law or something like that and says, okay, you have to do these things, and then you're like, oh, well, I'll, do, I'll only do these things, but I won't do the other things then you're not following the full counsel of the president. And so the same thing with theology, especially biblical theology. Okay, let me, uh, let me poke at that a little bit. So you're, when you say it, you are just trying to weed out the cafeteria Christian. Uh, that takes a little bit of this, but none of that, because I don't like mushrooms, but I'll take some of this. Uh, so is, is, that, is that correct? Uh, pretty much, yeah, buffet Christianity, where you you know you're like you're at a buffet, you're like I'll take, I'll take the stuff I like, and I know the so like the the person isn't ignorant about what's in the Bible. They know it's there. Mm. It's not like the person just doesn't know. They know about it, and they're like, I don't like that. That's there, and they're like, okay, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna go with that. I'm not gonna talk about it. I'm not even gonna think about it. I'm just gonna go with what I like. Okay, so um, I, I just wanted to make sure that I understood where you're coming from. Um, so someone like uh, Jefferson in the Jefferson Bible. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, or, or Martian. Um, is it Martian or Marcion? Marcion. Marcion, okay. Yeah. Um, so those would be people who don't, follow the whole counsel the full counsel of god as as you formulated yes they would be the best examples yeah, okay. and but then there's more nuanced like examples but like those are the, the best like you wouldn't find someone today 
very, well, I want to say rare, but it's becoming common where people do what Marcion did and and still insist that they're doing accurate theology. Right. So where does hermeneutics come into play here? Because I think that sometimes what you might say, uh, someone is not following the full counsel of God in, in their picking and choosing. And what they would say in response is, no, I am following the full counsel of God. I'm using uh, sound hermeneutical principles to determine what specifically applies to me as opposed to what doesn't. So, for instance, uh, you know, no one today, except maybe Orthodox Jews, would have a problem with wearing clothes uh, with mixed fabrics. Uh, mm. You know, there, there, there may be some other people uh, in that group, but um, in the mainstream, we we wear clothes with mixed fabrics all the time. We eat shrimp. Shrimp is delicious. Um, <laughs> these are these are things that were forbidden. Uh, by name, forbidden uh, in God's system. And so you might accuse us of not following the full counsel of God. You know, you know the Bible, you know what the Bible says about shrimp, and we would say, yeah, I know what the Bible says about shrimp, but that doesn't apply to us today because of this or that hermeneutical principle. Are you taking that into account? So, like, a conversation I would have with someone who's, like, Orthodox Jewish, would be again uh, like i wish i had notes for, for this but like if you study the mosaic law closely um there are some laws that were meant to go away so for example uh the tabernacle right you know that they had the tabernacle in the in the desert and stuff mm -hmm. so that eventually like god told them like when they get to the promised land uh, they were supposed to build a temple. But in the meantime, the tabernacle was supposed to work. So the Israelites, when they got to the promised land, they didn't even, like not until Solomon was the temple built. So like for generations, generations, they were just, you know, they were just worshiping however they wanted. And God just kind of just let them keep doing their thing without, you know, like even tell, like even, uh, the construction itself was like King David's idea, but um, all that to say, like the, there's there's intricacies in the in the Mosaic Law where like some laws are like some laws are not binding. I would say lots of them are like uh, for like situational, and and they're just not binding on Gentiles. So the thing is, uh, God's plan uh, from the very beginning was to unite. Uh, the nations to himself and so like the laws that were given specifically to the Jews were meant for a time to show that they were set apart uh, without going into too much detail like that's just pretty much the basics of it and so the the wearing of the one fabric clothing and the hairstyles and everything is supposed to supposed to like draw someone to be like hey what's what's up with these folks well what's going on over there uh, and that's that's pretty much the gist of it okay so um yeah i think there's there are more threads mixed fabrics to pull uh <laughs> from this particular nice shroud here uh so uh, just a little inside baseball. Uh, both Mac and I just came, uh, are just coming off of uh, work sessions, and uh, we're tired. <laughs> Brains are fried. <laughs> uh, we didn't even know. I had sent Mac uh, an email last night saying, "Look, I, I can't do the show. Uh, too much work. I'm not going to be able to do it." And then at the very last minute, I said, "No, I've made a little bit of progress. Let's go ahead and do it." We didn't even have a topic that we had discussed, and so I uh, told him what I wanted to talk about then. This was just a few minutes before the show started, folks. So uh, have a little bit of charity for Mac and a lot of charity for me. <laughs> or however that works. But uh, listen charitably. Uh, look, Mac is, Mac is um, you know, certainly as good at this as I am. We can come on the show. We can make it look good. But we are not good this morning. I can tell you that right now. <laughs> so. I think the audience can tell from the voices and everything, but we're going to power through. We are going to power through. So, okay. Um, so you would acknowledge that there are some things in uh, the Bible that aren't 
meant to continue. And we can use hermeneutic, hermeneutical principles to determine what was intended for us and what wasn't intended uh, for us and what uh, might have been a literal thing for some people, but might be figurative, um, you know, when that, you know, that may have been a shadow of something to come. Yes. Uh, all um, right. The, the entire Bible, at least if you want to be, if you want to say, okay, I want to understand what Christianity is, the whole Old Testament from the temple to the, the figures themselves, Moses, Elijah, David, all these are just prefigurings of Christ. Um, and that's, that's pretty much the, that's a hermeneutical principle. Like that's the principle that the early Christians used to understand where Christ fit into this story that's been told from Genesis all the way till their present day. Right. And for the record, I disagree with that as a hermeneutical principle. Uh, but I uh, grant, I mean, even the denomination I grew up with uh, talked about types and any types and that sort of thing. Um, so I, I understand it. I just don't think it's a legitimate way to do um, literary criticism because it assumes, it makes an assumption that what they wrote uh, 2,000 years before was in any way related to what was going on at that time 2,000 years later. And so that's kind of a thing that you layer onto the text and you'd say, well, you know, Moses prefigured Christ. Well, no, he didn't. Uh, the people who wrote Moses had nothing, no concept of Jesus. Um, uh, the people who wrote about David had no concept of Jesus. Um, and so you just have to kind of add a magical gloss onto it. Well, but the Holy Spirit is the one that is keeping the thread pure throughout the story. And so, great. That's a, that's a theological faith-based idea, but it is not true as literary hermeneutics well you could you could again take a closer look a closer look at what uh these fellows themselves wrote so like with david himself um and there was a big discussion about this on the on the boards when i was talking to brian b and we we're talking about psalm 22 and saying david is talking about his suffering and he's talking about his enemies are surrounding him and they pierce his hands and his feet and so I asked uh, Brian, uh, here's hands and feet. What does that sound like? And he just he was like, I, I, he, well, I don't know. Maybe he's just emotional stuff. And I was like, wait, okay, no, wait. What does Pierce hands and feet sound like to you? And he was like, uh, he just couldn't answer, honestly. And the answer is like, okay, that sounds like crucifixion. So it, it it's like, the thing is like, people read these things like David wrote about crucif like he prefigured crucifixion he, even if he was just writing about his his misery and people are just being jerks to him uh, there's that thing going on there and even we have Moses like talking about uh, one day it's I think it's the end of Deuteronomy he says that God is going to like uh, have to change your hearts or like circumcise your hearts so that you may follow him. Now that idea in and of itself finds its fulfillment in the teachings of Jesus, because for a while people thought that uh, to be a good Jew, what you had to do was to just keep the law. But like Moses in his final speech, uh, and anyone can go read it, final chapter of Deuteronomy, he pretty much says that you people are not going to be able to keep these laws. Like he says, after I die, I know you're not going to be able to follow these rules. Uh, God's going to have to come and do something for you in your hearts. And that specific teaching uh, finds its fulfillment in what Christ teaches about uh, being born again and all that. Okay, I... I take your point, but I, I it doesn't change my point. So I can say uh, that I have no idea what it what David was on about with piercing of the hands and feet. But it's only a faith statement that you make that it's about crucifixion. Well, that sounds like crucifixion to me, you see? So I'm going to say it's about crucifixion. I can guarantee you that you're not going to find very many Jewish scholars who agree with you. Uh, because they know the uh, the literary form way better than you or I, and they are not going to say this was David uh, 
prophesying about Jesus being crucified. So, um, you know, I, I think that it requires a, a Christian perspective and a faith perspective to read these Old Testament passages and get there. By the way, I think that Paul did uh, read the Bible like that. I think he was one of the first to read the Bible uh, like that. So I'm not I'm not saying that no one uh, read the Bible like that, but Paul was bringing, bringing in some new ideas uh, about Judaism. I don't want to go down this road. Uh, Judaism was dying, and there were a lot of people, a lot of interpretation, who were trying to find ways to keep their religion and culture alive in the face of the fact that they had no promised land, no money, no power. Uh, so what does what does Judaism look like in that situation? So I think that Paul was one of the people who came up with uh, you know some different and interesting interpretations uh, of those passages, and he may not have even been the one. I don't think he was the only one who came up with interesting and bespoke interpretations of that stuff. But that said, just because Paul claimed that this was a prefiguring of, uh, you know, crucifixion and Jesus and, you know, what have you, that doesn't mean it is. That's just one guy using bad hermeneutics to uh, lay a foundation to his new idea. Well, again, like, that's an interesting theory. Um, but again, like, uh, the way the ancient Hebrews read their scriptures, they would they 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 would see things like that and be like, this this is just not a mere coincidence. So like, um, you're you're saying that uh, they made it up, and I'm like, I don't think they could make it up because so like you say, okay, you said Jewish scholars would be able like if they were to affirm that Psalm 22 is a prefiguring of Christ, then they would need to stop being Orthodox Jews because, again, the whole chapter itself is is a big uh, story about crucifixion and someone suffering and then God vindicating them through a resurrection in the end. So, again, it's, again, even, even uh, if you look at it in the original language, um, it's not, it's not what some, some people say especially that verse that verse where it's people say like a lie in my hands at my feet that doesn't even make sense in the context so again it just comes out to what are you choosing to believe to be true because if you're like if you don't want it to be true then it won't be true but if you're like uh, being a seeker as dale is, is fond of saying and you see, wow, like this, who else could this be referring to? Like I can see it refers, okay, David is going through it, but it also applies to Christ. And there's like so many other uh, such portraits all over the Bible that point forward to Christ. Okay. Well, I, I mean, to make that case, you would just have to say that Jewish scholars don't understand their literature and Christians are better suited to understand Jewish literature than Jewish scholars. I don't buy it. And um, I will say that not even all Christians uh, interpret uh, those passages in Isaiah and Jeremiah and uh, such places as mm -hmm. being any kind of prophecy for Jesus. In fact, the first time uh, I, I remember, the first time I came across this idea, it was from uh, a couple of Christians who had co-authored a book that I can't think of the name of now. It's been a long time, but I used it actually in, a, in an adult Bible study, uh, and uh, we worked uh, through that uh, book. And so you don't even, I, I don't even need to go to Jewish scholars to find even Christians who uh, read that in other ways. Uh, so, you know, once again, yeah. it, it's a, it's well, a faith. It's, it's a, a faith valid statement. argument you're making. Uh, it's valid. But like my, my point is this, like the first people who saw it were Jews themselves. Like the first Christians were Jewish people. So if they if they say it, like oh, like it's a question of which Jews do you do you favor more? Like I I'm sticking with the original crew uh, that that saw the fulfillment of Christ in the old in their own scriptures. And they were Jewish themselves. It wasn't like some random guys, some random Romans or Greeks who saw him be like, oh, that's interesting. It's it was Jews. Yeah, they but were I, would, Jews I would say they, they were they were Jews on the edge of 
their culture. They were, uh, and so I know that you you would say, well, maybe Peter and the others were, um, you know, far away from the actual Jewish culture. You might uh, acknowledge that, but you might then come back and say, but Paul, Paul, he was a, you know, right dead center of uh, Orthodox Judaism. But we have his word on that. Uh, Paul changed his mind. Paul was rejected by the Jews, and for all we know, he was rejected before he turned to Christianity. Maybe that's why he turned to Christianity. Um, mm -hmm. We, I mean, historically, we have no insight into that. What we do know is that the actual Jewish leaders of that time, who also knew their Bible, did not read the texts that way. And so you can say, well, I will accept the interpretation of the rebels, and I can say I will accept the interpretation of the Orthodox. Well, well, actually, when you look, like, if you read Josephus, is uh, um, I'm blanking out, but he he ta he kind of like recounts the history of the Jewish people, mm -hmm. and he's he's pretty much doing the same thing that Matthew does, uh, where he's he's like uh, doing like typology and stuff, and saying, oh, look, this is a type of this. Same with uh, that guy Philo. I don't know if you've heard of him, Philo yeah, of Alexandria. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he he loves Moses, so he he mostly like wrote commentaries on the first five books, and he pretty much does the same thing. He's like he's looking at the scriptures and he's making typologies and doing the same thing. Um, and it, and he's the guy actually who um who first uses the word logos, uh, in referring to to God. I did not and know then that. John, uh, when you know John one. Mm -hmm. I mean, it says in the beginning was the word and everything. So he pretty much just like like the thing that they were doing, what the Christians were doing, the Jewish Christians, it like just pretty much to counter what you said, they were not doing anything that other Jewish folks uh, weren't already doing. So I, if I, another, I agree with another, that. I wasn't. Yeah, I, I wasn't. I wasn't okay. Yeah, I wasn't suggesting that. I, I, at least I wasn't trying to suggest that this was a new thing they were doing, but it okay. was a new interpretation of a thing that they did, which is one of the reasons why I don't think it's a valid hermeneutical principle. Jews debated their religion fervently uh, a lot. And so you can, I mean, there was a lot of argument over what this means or what that is. And, you know, people with, with a, an interpretive method as open as theirs was, you could come up with all kinds of things. And they did. So um, I just, I don't think the whole typology as a hermeneutic is a valid hermeneutic for literature and you know, one one way we know that is because we don't we don't use it in literature today. Again, that's like um, in a way, you're like uh, taking English literature and the rules that we have in in English uh, literature and and, and taking right, it. But, and it, saying, but if, okay, it, if, well, if it was valid, though, we'd be able to do it. We'd be able to look at Shakespeare and say, okay, there, King Lear is a type uh, for uh, Obama, you know, who is the <laughs> anti-type. And, you know, we would, we would say that, you see Shakespeare uh, prefigured, uh, King well, Lear prefigured, um, you know, you know we, could, we could do all kinds of things like that if, if that was a legitimate way of actually going about uh, textual criticism. It's not, which is why we don't. Right, but but you you realize that in the Bible, like there's all kinds of covenants and promises that God says, "I'm gonna I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna bring a a leader. I'm gonna do this." Like even, I think Malachi ends with like a promise of Elijah showing up or something through the last chapter, mm -hmm. and then there's a place in Ezekiel where God promises he's going to send David. Now, at this point in history, David has been long dead in the in, and his corpse is rotting in the ground. So what the Jewish folks are doing is that they're looking at these passages and they're saying, hmm, what does that mean? Because it can't be the literal David and can't be the literal Elijah. So these are promises that are being made. And so they're going to have to find their fulfillment. Now, I know you don't believe in prophecy or fulfillment or anything like that, but they 
did and they thought about these things. And for the Christians, in light of what Christ did, like he came and he did his thing, lived, died, rose again, ascended into heaven. And they are like, oh, wow, now it makes all of it make sense all the way from the beginning all the way to Malachi. It all clicks together. Everyone else has their interpretation, but it all makes sense if you see Christ as a fulfillment of what came before. Sure. And and that's and, what and that's what full counsel means, pretty much. Okay. So I, I do good. I because I wanted to get back to full counsel because I'm looking at the clock and we got about, we got about ten more minutes if uh, we're gonna hit that forty minute thing. And so I wanted to go back to um the New Testament. Uh so some of the things that Paul had to say uh to women. Uh I, I think that some of this discussion might fit in the whole council idea. So you might say, well, you can't just pick and choose. Uh, Paul said that women should not usurp or even have authority over men. And so uh, women pastors are a sinful thing. But Paul also said that women shouldn't uh, go to worship with their head uncovered. Um, you know, in speaking specifically about hats and veils and such. Um, we don't wear veils today. And so, you know, what, what the Christian who happens to believe that women should remain silent in the church and, uh, not have authority over men, they would say, well, that's literal and applies to us today. But as far as women wearing, uh, hats and veils, not so much. Understand, I grew up in a, a church culture where women did wear hats and veils and, a lot of them didn't, and they were frowned upon, and so it was kind of in that transitionary period for uh, my particular denomination. But that would be a thing where someone could easily say, well, you're not following the whole counsel of God, because uh, Paul clearly said that you got to wear a veil. And um, we would say, yeah, no, we don't. <laughs> so uh, how, how, do you, how do you see that sort of thing working with the whole counsel of God idea that you have. Yeah. Some churches have compromised on that and yeah, they have. I mean, uh, it, it's not, it's not a question of like, yeah, we don't. And, and I also, when I was a little, little kiddo, I remember like this is such a, a distinct memory in my head. Um, I knew instinctively if I saw a woman, with a hat on that she was going on to she was going to church i don't know why mm -hmm. that like it was such a tradition like okay oh, she's got her head covered she must be going to church mm -hmm. and i was like okay that makes sense uh but these days it's it's not a thing um and so it's like is it that the church forgot about it but i'll, I'll say this like if you go to places we, we could throw uh, long hair in there too women with long hair <laughs> versus short hair, hair because we oh, had we know. had whole sermons about, about that, that. I don't know about that one. Yeah, um, well, Paul said it. He was very specific, very specific about, about men it. having long hair. And, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, and about, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because women, I don't, I don't, women often uh, these days get buzz cuts. Yeah, um, but like again, with with such a, with such a command, again, you you kind of have to also like, uh, I'm I'm sorry, I'm not even. Uh, I'm kind of, my brain kind of froze there. Well, no, no, that's okay. So, would it so a woman with a buzz cut and no hat at church? Would you say that she's not following the whole counsel of God? Not in the same same sense as someone who perhaps like is like, well, uh, universalism is true and hell doesn't exist. Um, it it's different tiers. Okay. With, so you're it, saying it's a matter of degree, but but let's let's set the degrees aside. Mm. Is that is that person not following the whole counsel of God? Because that person is using a hermeneutical principle that says this is a clearly uh, cultural thing meant for specific people at a diff specific time and place. Yeah, right? like that's that's valid. Uh, that's that's a, that's an idea. Yes, that's. I mean, if that's how they see it, then I I believe like when it comes to stuff like. Again, you you don't like this. <laughs> I know you don't, but I'm gonna say it anyway. Um, when it comes to like theological triage, where you 
you sort out the important doctrines from the non important like the the top tier uh first order stuff stuff that you have to affirm in order to be a christian so uh nature of god nature of christ nature of salvation and then there's a second tier and then there's a third tier and then there's maybe a fourth tier or something where people are like we don't use instruments at our church because we don't like that um so let's say someone is under deep conviction that because people in the early church didn't use guitars and electric drums uh those should should shouldn't be seen in church and a whole debate arises but like with the hairstyle thing again it's a it's a question of culture like what did paul's culture look like when he was writing that was there something related to women's hairstyles and and how people perceived women who had elaborate hairstyles because i know um uh in that culture if you were walking around with your head uncovered then that kind of meant that you were a uh, kind of prostitute well obviously that's not true today but that's what it was like for his day so we have to be able to sift through things like that and be able to sort out what uh, applies to us and what does not apply to us today right so what that would lead me to suggest is uh, you should be more charitable when someone disagrees with you about something theologically in saying that they're not following the whole counsel of God because they might well be following the whole counsel of God from their perspective because they're using sure. a herm hermeneutical principle that you're not. And even if they're using it incorrectly, that's that's not an example of not following the whole counsel of God, in my opinion. That That, well, is, uh, that is just using it, uh, you know, a bit of uh, textual criticism in incorrectly. Yeah, I would be interested in knowing why someone believes the things they do. Again, it's again, even with something like Calvinism, which is a hot button topic and people just get so bent out of shape of, about it. Like with that, it, it's it's OK. What hermeneutical principles are you using? Like we could start by like saying, OK, what are the things that we both have in common? What are the things that we believe in common? And then from there, we work towards, you know, like finding a way in which we can uh, understand other principle, other doctrines in the same way that we understand the things that we agree upon. And usually like, again, this, I'm not like, I'm not excluding myself from this because I know for sure there are things that I may believe that are just totally wrong about, you know, uh, uh, things like, what do people get all right like baptism or the lord's supper things like that right because there's uh there's um, a whole bunch of views but the thing is uh if i'm talking to someone who has a different view i would want them to be able to like just put their hermeneutical principles on the table and then i'll put mine on the table and we can be like oh okay let's try and sort it out as opposed to just saying well you're stupid you don't know what you're talking about and that person says the same thing to me then no one gets helped in that situation. All right. Uh, so I'm looking at the clock, and uh, I think that's good. I think um, that's a good conversation. I do have a thought that I want to do for an after show that might be 15 minutes. <laughs> so even though we, we have not yet implemented our thing, uh, we need to get into the practice of doing it. And so uh, you know how to reach us, skepticsandseekers at squarespace.com. Log your discuss account, discuss away, send us an email, skepticsandseekers at gmail.com, which is an email that Mac does not yet have access to <laughs> because I just haven't uh, given it to him yet. But uh, I, I will continue to say send us because I will at some point. Uh, all right. <laughs> I, I promise. Um, and uh, so with that, um, we will see you in the comments <laughs> after show. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I just know people are just going to post off topic stuff. So uh, to the two people who listen to the show, <laughs> uh, looking forward to any ideas that you have constructive criticism or just say, well, I didn't understand this part. Like, honestly, the best thing is for all of us to come out of this learning something new as opposed to being like, well, what you said was so dumb or. Yeah. <laughs> I, I yeah. think one of the, if 
if nothing else, you can learn, uh, understand, and empathize uh, what the other person is thinking and going through and uh, humanize people that you strongly disagree with. Right. So, um, and I, I think the world becomes a better place if we can just do that. But I, I think that we have more opportunities than just that. But I, I mean, I think that's important if we can, if that's all we can manage. So that said, um, all right, Mac, I want to, I want to rewind, go back to my comment on the board, um, about this topic and relitigate what it means to know the Bible, <laughs> because I can't let this go. And, um, I feel like it, uh, there's more meat on this bone. So know the Bible. I, I said something to the effect that, um, we, we can't, there's no way to determine, um, what the, what was I, what were we talking about on the board? But I, I was at, at any rate questioning what it even means to know the Bible, uh, and to fully understand the whole counsel of God. Uh, because what that sounds like to me is you can't know anything unless you know everything. And I don't believe that for a moment. I don't think that you have to know everything to know anything, even about, uh, religion, um, you know, theology, uh, right. I, I think that there are some, you know, partial knowledge is fine. Um, it, because that may be all some people can muster, but you know, it's a matter of knowing, knowing the right bits and pieces rather than knowing the whole council. Uh, and so yeah. I, 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 um, I, I just want to, I, I want to ask some very specific questions like how much, um, really does a person have to know, do you have to know, uh, you know, with some intimate familiarity, every verse in the Bible, every Bible story, uh, well, you know, the, 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 uh, thrust of every book of the Bible, uh, <laughs> do you have to know the Bible's history? Do you have to know, uh, cultural norms at the time, things like that. What, what is, what, um, so what does it mean to know the Bible? Well, um, I believe I said this, uh, if not to you, to someone else, I, I used this, uh, sentence. I said, um, the main things are the plain things and the plain things are the main things. So when it comes to the Bible, the Bible has a very simple message, uh, one is that humans are sinners, and two, that God saves sinners. So, if if I were to summarize, like let's say I was going to visit someone who's like on their deathbed, and they're like, "Tell me about Christianity." Do I like do I give them a whole lecture on from Genesis to Revelation, or do I just tell them? And I can I summarize it in like ten minutes? Yeah, because otherwise now, the guy's gonna die in the middle of the big gas. Yeah, he's gonna he's <laughs> gonna die in the genealogies. Um, <laughs> Which is um, a bad way to die. Let me just say, <laughs> it's like the, yeah, but but the, the I don't know why you're laughing. This is it's it's fatigue. It's not because I'm laughing that someone is dying. Um, no. Um, I'm laughing at someone who's dying who's got a priest who's going through the begats. So <laughs> Yeah, I, I've never understood what the priest does. Um, but like but like the, the point is the point is okay, you ten minutes I'm about to tell me what, what the important thing is. And like again, the, the story of the thief on the cross, the the, the way that guy goes to heaven or paradise is the same way that every single person gets into heaven, not by their own efforts, but by Christ's intercession for them, Christ interceding for a person. So that guy was nearly dying and he asks for, for he says, uh, I'm guilty. You're not guilty. Uh, remember me when uh, you come into your kingdom. And so you have the guy acknowledging his own sin and seeing Jesus and seeing that even though from his vantage point, it didn't look like it, uh, saying that Jesus could save him and saying, remember me. So we are sinners. We all know this, like even if we wouldn't admit it, like we all mess up, we all make bad choices. 
Uh, and the only hope we have is for someone to be our substitute and do stuff so that our 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 sin in a sense is atoned for and that's what christ did he he atoned for our sins but also not just that he lived the life we never could live uh on our own and so what happens is because he is divine and the sins that we commit are like in a divine kind of uh, bank account he's the one who's able to pay off that sin debt and give us his his perfect righteousness so pretty much uh being a christian is about uh transformation and about uh new life and and not staying in the same place you're staying uh so to summarize it i would tell the person the most important thing to know is about yourself and also to know who god is god is a savior you're a sinner, and if you go to God, he will not turn you away. That's pretty much the gist of the entire Bible. Okay. From and Genesis be, to it would, Revelation. It would be a better yeah. Bible if that's all it said, uh, as far as I'm well, concerned. Well, that's, uh, again, if, if again, so so that's for the person who's like 10 minutes away from dying. Uh, for the person who has like 50 years <laughs> uh, to go, right? Obviously, that's not going to be enough for them. Why? It, it's enough, but it's not going to be enough. Why? Well, because... If if you stick with that for fifty years, then you're you're gonna get tripped up by all sorts of things that say, well, well, you're not living your life like Christ wants you to live life, so you're not trying hard enough. So it it it's possible that you're not really saved. And it's like, wait, like, and some some people believe that they believe that uh, it's up to their performance to earn them eternal life right but if they were having um uh, a divine uh presence within them via the senses divinitatis or whatever they would know that they were saved all the time so that i i disagree with the premise that they would start thinking that they well, were saved i don't think you some could people who think are it. saved for real still doubt that they are saved and then that they doubting, have then they have no senses divinitatis and that's a bunch of well, bs that's wait I mean, how does that work how do they because doubts can be a means of, of like, let's say you're doing, you don't like math analogies, but here's, you're doing a math problem and you're like, okay, you, you do it. And then you're like, wait, let me check the proof. Let me do a proof to see if the answer I got is right. That doesn't mean that you, the answer you put in is wrong. It just means you're like, okay, let me make sure that I didn't okay, mess but up. We don't have a sense of divinitatis telling us that our math answer is right. So Chris, that's why it's why that's why it's disanalogous. Well, well, you have an instinct, like you. Okay, wait, we don't have we text, don't have the the god of math living inside of us telling us when well, our Christians answers are right or wrong. Do. That's right. The thing. So if do. that's well, that's what I mean though. If they did, they would never doubt. It, it would no, be I, impossible I, to doubt. God's li he's right here, man. <laughs> I, don't, I don't because the doubt itself is a means of God showing you that. Okay, so let me. Okay, so someone who is not saved right and is just living their life however they want to live uh they don't have that sense of um what's it like okay i wow i need to repent i did something wrong i need to ask god for forgiveness doesn't have that at all the christian has that when they mess up they're like oh i'm sorry i offended you lord and they ask God for forgiveness and they repent and they turn away from their sin. So that turning away, that doubting, that turning back, that whole process in and of itself is the proof. But like uh, Paul, again, talks about this in Romans. He's like, don't sin so that you can like, you know, tell yourself like, okay, this is proof that I'm a Christian because there's a temptation again to be like, okay, I'm just going to keep living my life however I want to live. It's like, no, don't do that because that also in a paradoxical way shows that you're not serious or you're not actually saved. If right. But if still... they, once again, if they've got God living in them in some tangible way, they wouldn't want to sin anyway. So that, I don't. Right. I, I they just would want to sin less. Right. They're so, not sin less. So they, they would sin less. They wouldn't even ask the question: Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? That wouldn't. That wouldn't make sense to even wonder about. But you see, like logically, that's what people. Well, by human logic, that's what people say. 
right? If it's right, all great, the unsaved, then why can't the, un, just... the unsaved would say that. The saved would never say it. No, but the unsaved say that to the saved people. They say, hey, and the saved if, people if would it's say... all great. <laughs> no, someone told me, actually gave me this comment uh, this week on the board. They were like, okay, I'm just going to wait for God's grace to come upon me. And I'm just going to fold my arms. I'm going to sit here. I'm going to wait for the grace to show up. And it's like, that's not how grace works. It's not, it's not, it's not like, okay, uh, if, if I, if I'm saved, then I don't have to do anything. Like I don't have to exert my, uh, my will in a certain way. Like my exertion of my will proves that I have actually been saved. If I actually don't care, then that's proof that I don't actually have God living. Okay. Me. Uh, yeah. So, uh, 10 minutes, and I don't even want to use all of those. I want to say something controversial. I haven't thought it through. Uh, so this might be fun. No one who was saved in the Bible knew the Bible. Um, okay. So this, this emphasis on knowing the Bible seems to be a very strange emphasis since no one in the Bible knew the Bible. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, they, yeah. Um, People on the cross never read Galatians, uh, never read Ephesians, never knew anything about Revelation or eschatology or any any of that stuff. That's why uh, the emphasis is that you Christ is the one who saves you, not how much theology you've got in your head or how much Bible you read. The Bible is a means that God uses for Christians who are not going to be dying anytime soon as a way to keep you from. I guess being sucked into the vortex of worldliness. Mm -hmm. Does that does that make does that answer your question? No, um, it, I mean it. It's words that make good sounds, though. Um, and, and, well, and I, I want to answer the question so that it doesn't well, sound I mean, like you, just Someone words. listening may think you answered the question, and I I just don't see it. To, to me, uh, when I look at Jesus wandering around the countryside, you know, he never asked anyone. So how much of Isaiah do you know? He never he never did that. Um, you know he talked about the kingdom of heaven, uh, and it you know it's soon coming and now is and it's in your heart. And there was no first study Jeremiah uh, that that simply didn't exist. Well, um, I disagree because he went around actually telling people, "Have you not read?" what Moses told you, or did you not remember the prophets? Like that's when he was, when he was talking to Jewish, hang on, when he was talking to Jewish leaders who he right, didn't consider like, saved and who he, uh, he was perfectly well, free to be rude to. He around telling people that, but right, he, he talked right, but from those, the Right, but they Testament. weren't saved. And my specific formulation was no one who was saved in the Bible knew the Bible. So uh, like an example would be like uh, Paul or Peter. Right. Well, Paul wasn't saved because he knew the Bible. So it's true right. that he knew the Old Testament, but his knowledge of the Old Testament did not lead him to Jesus. Right. His knowledge I'm of the Old Testament you. led him to persecute. And so yeah. that's this is what I'm talking about. It wasn't Bible knowledge that people needed to have. And there, I don't I can't think off the top of my head anyway, of a single person who I would say knew the Bible when they were saved or at least who knew it accurately. Well, no one actually knows it accurately. Like that's why you have to learn. If you have to learn something. Okay, but they who who okay, who didn't know it, it, who didn't know it um, um heretically guy, almost. Uh, Paul's Paul's guy, knowledge uh, of I'm sorry. I'm Go sorry. Ahead. Um Apollos, right? You know like he was right. he was very, he, he and then and then uh the two the couple uh Priscilla right. and Aquila, and, Aquila. Mm -hmm. and they take him aside and they're like they instruct him properly how to you know, preach or, or evangelize. And he's like, okay, cool. Got it. And so like you have folks all over the, all over the, yeah. like even in, in Acts 15, when they're deciding on whether uh, the Gentiles should be, uh, whether they should eat food sacrificed to idols and they go and they find a, a verse in Amos something. And they say, well, actually the word of God says this about, uh, you know, how God is going to join the Gentiles to himself. Uh, Those are gospel. people who are already saved. Uh, so don't really count so in my formulation. 
uh, the Bereans. They, they uh, were already saved. They, were, they weren't. It actually says that they were uh, more. So Paul rolls into town and he preaches the gospel. And then they're like, oh, nice, cool. We'll get back to you after we confirm uh, what you said lines up with what is in the scriptures. And then Luke says uh, they were more noble minded than the believers in Thessalonica because they went and searched out uh, the scriptures to see whether what Paul was saying was the truth. So again, right. there you have people who, who were studying the Bible to see if what the apostles were teaching was I, I will, I consistent. Will con I will con conditionally grant the Berean um, example. I would have to go back and look at that uh, carefully because I don't know that the Bereans were exactly unsaved at that point in time. Uh, but Paul, Paul did say that they... Um, you know, search the scriptures to to see what he if what he said was true. But once again, they're they're just Paul is giving an interpretation, and they're looking at it to see if they can accept or not accept that interpretation. But at at any rate, whether the Bereans are uh, an exception or not, I think I think the rule stands pretty generally still that. Um, in the Bible, when people are saved, it wasn't because they knew the Bible. Um, I maybe I'm not understanding the, the questions. Like they didn't know the Bible. Like at some point, they would have known the Bible. Like if they know well, God in the in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Like they would have known something like that. Right? Which, Genesis okay, 1, well, 1. that would that wouldn't have contributed to their salvation uh, because at the time, for instance, when Peter yeah. preached to the uh, crowd on Pentecost, well many of the people that were there would have had some familiarity with some parts of the Bible. And you have to also remember that uh, there were Jews who only believed that the Bible consisted of uh, the books of Moses. Uh, so even among Jews, there there wasn't even agreement on what the Bible was exactly. So um, when Peter preaches, yeah, he gives he gives a biblical reference or two, but mostly he's talking about Jesus, which was not in a in a Bible um, at that time. So uh, even even that sermon is not an example of people being saved because of Bible study. So I, I'm making this point to say the whole the idea of you have to know the whole counsel of God doesn't make a lot of sense of almost any of the conversions that we read about in uh, the New Testament. Well, it does because, again, like a good example would be the Bereans and then um, Jesus himself telling his disciples um, to, um, to like when he's, he's talking to the two guys on the road to Emmaus and he begins with Moses and he goes through all the prophets, uh, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained all the scriptures to all them. Right. And that's a, that's uh, a good that's a good example. And I will grant that, except to say those people were already Jesus followers. So it's not like they Jesus was. Active. They, were, they, were, like, they didn't believe he was alive. They were leaving Jerusalem. They were like, we are right. out of here. No, they, did, they didn't believe he it was alive, but nobody believed he was alive. So even right. even his own uh, 12 or 11 at that time didn't believe he was alive. So let's. let's right. And Jesus gives them a Bible study. Like right, he but shows up and he's like, okay, Bible study. Time but that's not what walking. saved them. They were saved anyway. They were saved right. at that time. The people in the road to Emmaus were saved before Jesus gave a Bible study. His well, disciples were saved. know that they were saved before Jesus gave the Bible study. It doesn't say that. Okay, well, they were they were his disciples. It does say that. They were his disciples, but they didn't believe that Jesus would. So, okay, so Like Jesus I said, nobody believed rise. Jesus rose. No one, uh, right, right. No one believed. And so... So Jesus they didn't learn it up, from the Bible. Right? No, yeah, exactly. But like, no, 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 wait. So Jesus shows up, and instead of saying, here I am, he starts with the Bible study from Genesis all the way to Malachi, whatever, or mm -hmm. Second Chronicles. And once he's done and they're like, no, wait, we, we want more Bible study. And then Jesus says, OK, I'll stay with you guys. And then they recognize him afterwards. So the Bible study comes first. And then Peter's sermon, he he 
he talks about David's Psalm. I think it's Psalm 16. He says, oh, Psalm. David wrote this in, in his Psalms right. about how uh, you'll not allow your Holy One to see decay. But right. David is dead. So that has to be referring to the Messiah and something like that. Right. So like every time the apostles are preaching, except I'll, I'll throw this one in for you so, so that if you want to use this in the future, you can, except when Paul is in Athens and he's talking to the to the people there who have no idea uh, what <laughs> who Jesus is or what the Hebrew scriptures are. Right. But I would and say that to those people were and, never saved. <laughs> So. No, some people actually get saved from that sermon. Okay. Um, so if you want to use an example, use that example because he starts with, okay, he quotes from their poets and he says, uh, some of your po poets have said this, uh, we're, all, we're all God's offspring. Yeah. Again, yeah. I'm, I'm butchering it, but you know, no, you know what I'm saying, look, right? Uh, we're, we're both going off the cuff here. And so I, like I said, I haven't thought this through completely but uh i'll i'll come back on the board uh if i have time to revisit this to to yeah i'm trying, uh, to, help, to I'm trying to help you out no <laughs> i just i understand I, I i appreciate the steel man effort i will i will consider it more i think the general rule still favors me but probably i would grant that it's not every situation um so i'll I'll certainly look at that. Look, thanks for the discussion. Uh, the fact that neither one of us had any time or preparation or even knew that this was going to happen, I think we did pretty good. So uh, <laughs> with that with that said, though, uh, I think I'm going to get out of here and um, get back to this project. And uh, we will see you next time.